My name is John Beeman. I currently live in Sarasota, Florida, but I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to work out of uh, high school as uh, unloading trucks and eventually got a job with the Pennsylvania Railroad. And I had taken a typing class in uh, high school, so I knew how to type. And this was as a clerk typist for the railroad. And at the same time, I was uh, dating a girl uh, who was Catholic. And uh, I was taking instructions from a local priest. And the priest said to me, you should consider joining the service. And I said, why is that? And he said, because if you don't, you're going to get that girl pregnant and you'll be working at Allison's with five children. I went down to the recruiters and they were all down in what is now the federal courthouse. I went to see the Marine recruiter and I was impressed by the simplicity of the circumstance. That is, he said, I could promise you a short haircut and one hour of sleep a day, maybe, and that's the best I can do. And I thought that sounded pretty honest, actually. So I left in April of 64. Got to uh, San Diego late in the day. A guy picked us up in a pickup truck with a cover over the back. And it was downhill from that point on. Um, so we went through the normal boot camp process uh, with the infantry training at uh, Pendleton. I think I was assigned to mess duty the first week or two while they got enough troops to form up the uh, group. Anyway, we finished up uh, infantry training. I got orders from Memphis, Tennessee, where you went down for uh, picking a school or being picked for a school. My first choice was GCA, ground control approach. But that school was full. Apparently it was a very popular um, school. I, had, I was doing fire watch, and the radio avionics guys were always talking in their sleep. It seemed very uptight. So I decided to go the electrician route because it just seemed a little, they were a little jumpy. Uh, and I didn't want that pressure. So I went to Jacksonville at the NA, Naval Air Station, and I remember the, they gave us travel money, and you could fly, drive, or take a train. I didn't have a car, so I decided to save money and take the train. So I took the train from Memphis, Tennessee, to Jacksonville, Florida, and that, in and of itself, was quite an adventure. But anyway, as we get to Jacksonville, I'm looking at my watch and thinking, it's getting pretty late, and I'm supposed to report in by midnight. And it's the train's supposed to get in at 11. And at some point in time, I stopped the conductor and said, you know, I got to report in at midnight. And I said, is this train going to be on time? And he cocked his hat back and he said, son, I've been on this man's railroad for 23 years. We've never been on time. And we're not going to be on time tonight. But the good news was, I got a cab and, the, and he got me there pretty quick. And I was just a few minutes late. It was, it was no big deal. They let me in. And, but I was, I must tell you, I was very nervous about being late to my first sort of official duty station. So I went through um, the school. It was, I think, 26 weeks. Uh, graduated in mid-65. Um, I, I had a 57 Chevy that I had brought down to Jacksonville at some point in time, and then I took guys to town and for gas and money and so on. My plan was to drive that car to California because I really was clueless that anything was going on. Maybe there wasn't much press about it. So when I checked in El Toro a couple of weeks later, and it was sometime in mid-July, I think, and I went to the um, check-in sergeant, and I said, I'd like to go to VMFA 314. And he said, nope, you're going across the street. And I said, what's across the street? 
He said, you'll find out. And he says, one more thing, don't unpack your bags. And I said, why not? He said, because you're not going to be here long. Where am I going? I asked. You're going to Vietnam. I said, where's that? He said, you'll find out. So I go over and report in LTA, and I'm assigned to AMS 36, and I'm a PFC. So I spent most of my time testing field stoves. But I remember wanting to know where we were going, and they kept saying, you know, we can't tell you. It's a secret. So um, I can't remember whether it was uh, August 10th or the night before I went to a steakhouse in Long Beach, California. And this was kind of the last meal. And I was by myself. I was in khakis, sat in a restaurant, can't tell you the name, at dinner at the end of the meal, asked her about check, and the waitress said, there's no check. And I said, what do you mean? She said, there was a fellow and his wife sitting at another table. They wanted to buy you dinner, which I thought was a very nice gesture, and one that I've tried to emulate over the years with other servicemen. So they packed us up on the Princeton, LPH-5. Um, we got to Hawaii. We were going to resupply there. We had mail waiting for us. And the interesting thing was the newspapers had gotten there, and the newspapers, big headlines, MAG-36 goes to July, Vietnam. And I'm saying, right, big secret. So. Uh, we loaded supplies. I did get off the ship at Pearl and went to a payphone. And of course, payphones were that dime then, and answering machines were not commonplace. So I called my mother, nobody home. I had to borrow a tie from somebody in line because I guess I really wasn't used to using payphones. Uh, again, we loaded back up. Headed off to Subic Bay. Um, the bosun's mates from the Princeton introduced me to Lagapo. I was horrified. As we walked across the bridge from Subic Bay into Lagapo and saw the young kids down in the dirty river with the uh, screen cones begging for money, I thought this is because I had never been. In, Me in Mexico, I'd never been in a third world country, um, but the poverty was just startling. You lose all that after a few years, but uh, at the time it was uh, stark. And um, I don't recall how long we were in Subi Bay, but we were there a while because I think we hit the beach in July. August 30th or August 31st, I don't remember exactly. But I remember as we, I went over on a bike boat, you know, we actually did the rope ladder down the side of the Princeton into the mic boats. We hit the beach, you know, we've got the rifle at high port. Here's the mama son, hey GI, you wanna buy rifle cover? Hey GI, you wanna buy foot locker? Foot lockers, I would point out, were made out of Budweiser beer cans, but uh, you know they never leave, never leave anything trashy. It's somebody else's treasure. Um, and the other thing I remember when I hit the beach, I had oversurfed myself at Subic Bay with San Miguel beer. And if you hadn't drank the local San Miguel beer, it could have its way with your digestive tract. So I hit the beach with a roll of toilet paper, lucky for the. First place I could go to have some comfort it was very, uh, you know, I guess it's not a great thing to talk about, but it was just the reality. From there, you know, we went up this, the hillside of July it was just typical native vegetation at the top, and just over the hill was a tank in place uh, because we'd listen to him at night, fire off rounds. We dug fighting holes. The uh, terrain was too tough to actually dig a foxhole. 
you can only get down maybe 12, 15 inches in this red clay. And then you sort of put sandbags. And we did that for some period of time. Then I got ass assigned to a carpentry crew. And our job was to build uh, the frames on which they put the GP tents. Uh, they had eventually came in with a bulldozer and they just ripped out um, terraces where we put the GP tents up the normal way with just stakes. And I was in a tent with 20 other guys and these were several Korean veterans and they were very helpful because they could teach you the difference between incoming and outgoing. And I learned quickly that about the third or fourth time I jumped out of my rack and dove into a, a slick trench. Pappy Mizell, who was a staff sergeant, said to me, son, if it goes boom, whoosh, you're okay. But if it goes whoosh, boom, then you want to get into the bunker. Um, so that was one of those valuable lessons. The other was don't play cards with Pappy Mizell because my first paycheck, I signed it over to him. All my money gone. I mean, actually, you know, when we were at Kiha, we were on the beach, kind of away from the action. Uh, we were just kind of forming. We really had not, uh, I mean, at least I had not done anything or participated in anything. Um, you know, in retrospect, I suppose we we lived pretty uh, poverty stricken. I mean, it was we were muddy, we were dirty, but you just I mean, I guess I just took it for granted. I learned how to take an aluminum wash tub and pour the water over my head, soak down, and then rinse it off, and that was your shower. Um, I learned to eat sea rations out of a helmet because that's just the way you did it. Never thought much about it. Um, so I got assigned to a carpenter unit with a sergeant who was a salty old fella, but he knew his carpentry, and I, I really enjoyed that. And you can see I'm in a helicopter squadron, but so far I haven't touched a helicopter or even gotten close to one. So during that time, I think we built 20-some uh, GP tent hooches, and then we built the mess hall. And outside the mess hall, and on the Papa Smoke website is a photograph that I think I must have taken. But it was a sign with the names of all the fellas that had built the mess hall. And mine is the last name at the bottom of the sign. And I was glad for the mess hall because in that interim, every day for lunch, after we got past the sea rations, we would go down to the beach to those blasted field stoves and we would have split pea soup and spam sandwiches. And I absolutely grew to detest, and still to this day detest, spam sandwiches or spam and split pea soup. When I see a bowl of split pea soup, I have flashbacks and it's just not something uh, that I'll eat to this day. So sometime at the end of the uh, building the huts, they were looking for uh, guys to go to HMM 363. And they were down at Quinyan supporting the Tiger Division of the Korean Army. I was there for, I think, about four months. They again looked for volunteers, and they were looking for volunteers to go uh, on a deployment back on the Princeton with HMM 364. One of the things I discovered was, as I volunteered for these moves, off types of promotion followed quickly. So when I had gone from um, July or Kia down to Aquinian, I was promoted from PFC to Lance Corporal. So I arrived at uh, back at Kia with 364 as a Lance Corporal. And we were getting ready for the deployment. 
And I recall that I spent a lot of time in the back end of the UH-34D, sweating like a stuck hog. And you got used to it, but you you would sweat these big puddles of water. You'd look down, and you'd be amazed. It might be five cups of water into your face as you're in the back of the aircraft doing something with a wiring harness or whatever piece of equipment that you were tinkering on. Um, anyway, we deployed on the uh, Princeton. I was on 364 uh, again. I don't think I flew much with 364, if at all, because I was probably still a Lance Corporal, and I don't think I was up high enough in the ranks to get uh, flight skins. Um, so at some point in time, I decided I was going to extend my tour of duty, and uh, Dave McGee said, that's fine. Uh, have you passed the physician's test? And I said, physician's test? What physician's test? And I'll leave out the expletive, but he said, because you must be nuts to want to extend another six months. I extended another six months, and I was assigned to uh, HMM 361. They were forming up in Okinawa. Uh, I went to that group, I think, in January of 67. Um, we went from Da Dang uh, to Dong Ha, um, and I was with that unit about nine months, and I did a lot of flying with them. We did the resupplies for Camp Carroll, Geolet, Quezon, and a lot of the old top uh, places. Uh, then in September the 3rd, we were wiped out by uh, North Vietnamese border attacks, lost all our aircraft. Uh, we, they took us, they came in on 53s and took us out a day or so later. We had 40, I think 41 or 44 wounded, but nobody killed. But I remember the commander said he couldn't figure out how everybody got wounded because it could have been from their shells or it could have been the ammo dump. Whoever built the uh, compound had the dubious wisdom of putting the hooches in between the ammo dump and the fuel dump. This is where all that trading pays off because to some extent, I think we compartmentalize our fear and we do what we have to do. Um, I do agree that, you know, if you've had a hairy flight or if you've been in a hot LZ, that when you get back, you may take a stiff drink and kind of let the air out a little bit. Um, you may be exhausted, but I think during that time frame, when the manure hits the oscillating blades, you really are focused on the things you're supposed to be doing, um, how you're gonna get it done, and you really don't think about being afraid. At least I didn't now. But I have to say, when they wiped out the aircraft at Dong Ha, I, I think at that point in time, my fear was out of the box, and it was like, Whoa, baby, that's too close for comfort. And as I said, you know, we've been flying up on the DMZ and had flown a lot of insertions and extractions in different places. At that point in time, I just said, I've had enough. My, my time is up. I don't know why. So I didn't push that envelope beyond where you have to make that last flight. Um, so I think training is the the key thing that saves all Marines from absolutely melting down. We flew out in and out of Quezon quite a bit. We spent nights at Quezon because of motor attacks, because we couldn't get out. Uh, we did a lot of resupplies for Camp Carroll, Geolet, and those, a lot of those were fly in, never land, kick the stuff out the door, and away you went. So when we lost all our aircraft, went back to Marble Mountain, I had actually extended another six months. But I really was having the feeling that it was time to wrap it up. So I went to the 
searched at the avionics shop and said, I'm really done here. I've been away from home 25 months. I think it's time to pack it in. I had lost all of my gear. They all got burned up in the, uh, I had shipped a footlocker home sometime earlier that had some stuff in it, but I basically lost all my uniforms and they gave us, you know, all I had was my rifle, uh, t-shirt, trousers, boots. That's what I came out of the slick trench with. And that's, they eventually gave us new gear. Um, so anyway, the sergeant arranged for me to be shipped home. I uh, went to Okinawa, stayed in Okinawa, I don't know, a few days, I don't remember how long. Um, you know, there was, it was, there was no uh, counseling, no interaction, no, they just basically took you to Okinawa, put you on a big uh, commercial aircraft. I think it was a Continental Airlines. Flew to Yokohama. Yokohama, we flew to Travis. Travis, they gave you your sea bag and said, bye. And I mean, that was it. There was, I mean, you were, you were home. And I remember being on the bus going from Travis to San Francisco airport. And I'm looking out the window and I see this female in a pair of tight pants, bell-bottom pants and long hair. And I'm thinking she looks pretty good and she turns around and she's got a beard. And I'm thinking, I've been away too long. In my 25 months, I was in five different units. I was in 361, the longest. I was in Purple Foxes, the next, long, next longest. Uh, 361 were a bunch of great guys and I, and I see some of them here. But 364, has a camaraderie that's just difficult to describe. Um, and, and even as they've transitioned to the 46s, we now see uh, a little more of a blending of the 34 guys, and I guess I'm old school in that sense, and the 46 guys um, that is beginning to take place as we all begin to appreciate that with, that, with, with the exception of the aircraft. We were all in the same unit with the same goals and objectives. And, uh, and maybe it's Swifty. It gave us something to rally around. That, that, that card that said, we give a shit, had real meaning. And, and I, uh, when I rediscovered the Purple Foxes in 1999, I remembered those cards and the notion that we really gave a shit about everything we did. We wanted to do it well and, and purposefully and as properly as possible. And I think that's, there's just an esprit de corps about the Purple Foxes that is slightly different. Now I'm sure that there are units that would take issue with that and that's fine because uh, everybody's got their own answer. But I know having been in if I count 264, my last unit, having been in six different units, the Purple Foxes are far and away the most um, interesting, uh, charismatic unit of all the units that I was in.